What does it take to become an elite 40k player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40k Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law, and this is episode four of the podcast, and we're really glad you're able to join us today. In this episode, we're going to dive in with a top-level player. He's playing White Scars. He lost to Admech at the Maryland Open this last weekend. In part one, we're going to dive into the common mistakes he made, secondary choices, target priority, all that good stuff. Stick around for part two afterwards, and we'll really dive into what he learned from the event. We'll dig into his list building, strategies he's looking to implement, and the just overall elite player mindset. So today, I'd like to introduce my co-host. He's backed by popular demand. Much like Cowbell, the people needed more of him. Ask and you shall receive. He's a nine-time Team USA member, Adepticon champion, three top LVO finishes, countless GT, major wins, all kinds of top finishes, Mr. Brad Chester. <sighs> Yay, Brad. Brad, I uh, I heard a bad rumor that you were the one who beat our player again today, our guest. Did, did you actually, <laughs> did you disguise yourself as Sean Reynolds and play Adam like this last weekend? I did not. I was going to come in a disguise in a fake name, PJ style, and just keep showing up to tournaments, but I decided against it. Okay. Also, it was really far away, so I, I decided against the travel. We just really need to clarify that, yeah. I'm wearing a Michigan hat. Are you sure? I was definitely not. I would have been wearing my <laughs> Buckeyes hat. Thank you very much. All right. Our guest today is the 2017 Delaware winner. He got third place at ATC 2016, third place at Adepticon 2017. He has multiple top Adepticon and Nova Open finishes, Mr. Mike Taylor. Mike, how about you tell us about the last time you lost a game? <laughs> Well, that was uh, this weekend. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was at the Ellen uh, Open GT. I have questions. <laughs> I got lots of questions. We're really just going to dig into them. I've got plenty of answers. Where do you guys want to start? Let's go with your, uh, basically, let's start with what you actually took. Uh, let's start with your basics. The, let's go with what's in your list and tell everybody what's in the list. And then we'll go into your secondaries in that game. And we'll, then we'll kind of go on what the thing is you, the whole purpose of this is to, we take everybody that's lost a game and we go, we always learn from our losses. The best players always come from defeat and learn more and don't make those same mistakes again. So we want to go with kind of what's in your list and then, you know, what you were thinking as far as the game and what you could have done better. So we'll start with what's in your list and the secondaries you took. Oh, that sounds great. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. Um, it's great to kind of share with the community, uh, you know, all, all the mistakes you've made and hopefully others can learn from them. Preferably you try and learn from others' mistakes, not your own. Um, kind of a hard-headed guy, so it takes it takes a lot of lumps to learn. But um, yeah, so my my list, uh, it's a White Scars Battalion. Um, I've always played Imperials, so I've been trying to figure out how to keep the uh, Space Marine White Scars piece going. Uh, and so I, for this kind of version of it, I, I focused on... And as I put it together, I was thinking about how do you deal with a Drakari kind of the threat, you know, you're going to odds are you're going to play a Drakari player in the later round. So I was kind of planning for it. And so uh, with that, I started with kind of the core of the list, believe it or not, is uh, is six characters. Um, I decided to bring in Khan because I was like saying Khan when I play games just for fun. Uh, but the guy is a beat stick and he also the plus one to wound is, is fantastic in close combat. Um then I uh, then I also included a uh, a, uh, a chaplain on a bike um, and made him master of sanctity. Uh, I gave him rights of war. I gave him the three inch fox of spiritum to give him a nine inch aura. Uh, and in the litanies also changed a little bit in that um, I, I had the typical, of course, the rerolls in close combat. But I added uh, recitation of focus for plus one to hit because I added a little more shooting to my list. And then I also put in a, a little bit more on the uh, on the five up field of pain mortal wound uh, piece because of demons and of course uh, Admech and others with the mortal wound spam. Um, the uh, the third character uh, is a uh, is a uh, a blade guard ancient. Uh, really just for the, uh, the, the plus one uh, to core units uh, in close combat. And then also he buffs the Blade Guard, which is a unit in my army. Um, the, uh, the, the, fourth, the fourth character is, of course, the, uh, the Apothecary. You don't leave home without him. Um, made him um, a selfless healer. 
uh, and also gave him the plume of the planes runner so I can get a plus one advance and, and charge to all my infantry. Uh, additionally, I, I had an inquisitor. Uh, I was about which, to say, let's, let's talk about the spicy tech though. Now you, I, you, you said all the easy stuff. Let's talk about the spicy characters. So, that so that guy has been money since I added him in about six months ago. Um, you know, I plus one CP gave him uh, two, two casts, two denies. I originally added him because I kept up running against C tans and they were giving me all kinds of pain. And so I said, all right, how do I take them out in one turn? And I adding in a uh, basically a mortal wound spam and that a targeted smite, a smite, and then one power called Terrify, which is fantastic for denying Overwatch. And if you got to deal with Necrons or anything like that, it has a powerful Overwatch uh, facet to their game. Um, and so with that, I also gave him the uh, Blade of the Ordos, because you never know when you're going to run it against demons or, or chaos scum is what I like to call them. Uh, and so he's kind of a little beat stick with a flamer that runs around. He can advance, cast powers, and inflamer stuff. Um, and then uh, I feel like I'm missing another character. Is that five or six? You forgot the spiciest tech in the yeah. company champion. Definitely the spiciest. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, of course. He is the latest addition. So um, I don't know if you guys ever heard of this guy, Kellen Sezen. Uh, he's a local guy here in D.C. He and I uh, set up a game, and he played Drakari. And I said, hey, brother, you know, he, he basically beat the tar out of me. And I said, how do I kind of add some spice to my list? And, and the company champion is, is a character that most people don't even think about. Um, and so I added him in for 70 points, gave him the uh, Triumph, the Blade of Triumph, which is a flat three damage. And when you go to turn three, you become Super Saiyan, and it's a four damage AP4 weapon, wounding, you know, strength seven, uh, hitting on twos, rerolling against characters. Uh, and he can, he can one-shot most big characters and even vehicles if he gets the plus one to wound around cons. So, so those are the six uh, characters that are kind of the core of the army. And they, they basically fuel the rest of the army, which is three, three obsec uh, squads, two intercessor auto bolt rifles, an incursor squad just to do some screening uh, and get me kind of board control up the middle. Uh, three Vanguard vets, even though it's a 10 man and a five man, but three vet, five man Vanguard vet squads, Storm Shield, Lightning Claws, just because once, I mean, even on turn one, you give them a two CP combat doctrine and, and they're off and running. And, and with the plus one, uh, plume of the planes runner i can get a 19 inch move if i roll a six on turn one just getting out there um so that's uh three five-man vanguard vets um then i've got the the four-man blade guard it's really just more of a block to kind of help me with center board control and to kind of protect my characters with that though i did add in a two-man uh, company veteran squad um with storm shields and lightning claws uh, really they just sit behind cover and if you don't have indirect fire good luck killing them and they're going to sit there and just protect my characters as they fan out from there to include sitting on objectives completely in the open. As long as the vet, uh, the company vets can't get touched, then I could sit there all day and just keep uh, racking up uh, primary points. Um, and in uh, the last kind of the shooting piece I mentioned at the top, um, the standard three-man attack bike, multi melt attack bike squad. I used to have two in the list prior to Drakari, uh, but I decided to trade out the second one for two uh, three-man suppressor squads. Um, just those Hellstorm auto cannons have been money against uh, light light vehicles. Like yeah. you could crack was, open. A, I was going to say, I was going to ask you about the uh, the combination of the two the suppressors and the uh, the whirlwind. Um, yeah. So the uh, so the, the 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 suppressors really a couple things. Um, white scar strat you can advance them uh, and put them in assault weapons. And so on turn one, they're and if I give them the plus one to hit. They're hitting on twos, uh, you know, one AP flat two damage, but hitting on twos, rerolling ones around con is awesome. Um, if I wait a turn and go to turn two, they become AP two because that's assault doctrine. I always go from dev to or dev to tactical, I mean, and into assault. So because of tactical doctrine, assault weapons are plus one AP. Um, and then the uh, and then the whirlwind is really the secret weapon because a lot of people don't think about the fact that there's a stratagem called suppression fire. Uh, and when you hit something with it, all you can do is hit it. You don't have to wound it. Uh, one CP and they fight last. And it doesn't clarify Titanic or anything. It's just anything it gets hit, uh, it is it is going to fight last. So like the, um, you know, like a, uh, uh, well, I'm drawing a blank on the the big demon uh, princesses, whatever they are, the Slanish demons. Um, keepers. You know, keepers, thank you, Keepers. I, I've, I'm having like PTSD from this weekend fighting so many of them. But yeah, the Keepers, no, they, uh, I mean, you can make them fight at least 
on an issue, you know, I mean, on uh, on uh, the normal, and that they they're fighting at the same time, and then you throw in a charging unit, you get to fight the form. But you can also do things like the um, like the uh, the Necron, uh, the Silent King. You know, as always, fight first. You basically take that away from them, and then you hit them with something that'll take them down in one turn. So, yeah, because all the guys that have yeah. for everybody listening on that that doesn't get it, the anything that has basically strike first if you hit hit it with strike last they basically cancel each other out so that way you go back to if you're charging you can then go first against them yeah and then if you throw in oh by the way i mentioned with the the company uh champion he always fights first uh if he's an engagement range of characters so as long as he gets with the engagement range of a character he'll fight first doesn't mean he has to strike the character he could then kill a incubi squad that's next to him next to him instead of going after the character so that's that's another piece when you hit them with the fight last uh and then you throw that character at them um usually you're going to pick up a succubus or or anything that is supposedly thinking they're going to fight first now they're going to fight last and you're going to wipe them out that's a that's a super spicy list i love i love all the random tech you put into that and i was looking i was like man that's just like that's just murder you know this the damage four dude after turn three just like picking up characters and protecting your own that's pretty awesome um Brad, you want to go ahead and give us the rundown on the ad mech list that he lost to? Let me shake and bake it in. We have Stygies. He also has an Inquisitor with a Tech Priest Dominus, a Tech Priest Manipulus, three units of Vanguard. We've got three big units of Priests, nine, nine, and eight. Two uh, two two-man chickens, uh, both with LAS cannons. A single Raider unit of three, the Automatic include three disintegrators. When you make your your army a battle scribe for Admech, it just puts them in for you. Uh, then he has the two archcopters, uh, flyers, and then two uh, Dune Rider transports. Uh, who did he start him in, actually? I'm assuming, where did the uh, third priest go, Mike? Yeah, he, uh, he outflanked them. Okay. Strategic reserves. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, yeah, just to, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I, for his list, you know, it, it, it's very similar. So um, almost every week I spar with Mark Hurdle because he's, he's, he lives just around the corner from me, and so we're just beating the tar out of each other. Uh, and so the funny thing going into this game, I, I kind of had a little – at the same time, I knew what to expect, but at the same time, you know, going in, I, I, I felt like, all right, I, I can do this because uh, I, I can beat Mark's list, and I have, but we're about 50-50. So I knew I had to play a pretty – pretty clean game, pretty on top of my game. Um, and so, you know, I, I knew what to expect. I knew what his list did. I played Stygies all the time. I know they can, they can scout up, uh, you know, turn one and get in my face. And so, but I also knew that I needed to be careful about getting him a three up involve with those Fulgurite Electro Priests by giving him a free charge, you know, munching up a unit and then turning into, you know, pretty much unkillable units. So, um, so I kind of knew what to expect. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how, you know, looking at his list, I pretty much knew what it was going to do, um, you know, but uh, I, I kind of chose to go in a different direction, which is probably why I lost the game. But I guess we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> I so need to hear. You're like, I knew exactly what I had to win, and I did exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it was um, – so Sean is a Sean is a great player. Um, he uh, – you know, I don't, he he was in the Nova Invitational back 2016 time frame, 17 time frame when we were both playing. That was about when I was, I would say, at the top. As, as much as I can get on the top of my 40K game, that's pretty much where it was. And then took a year off and then COVID hit and everything went to crap. But um, but Sean was, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty premier player, New, knows his list, knows what he's doing. Uh, and I mean, Admech is no slouch. Like you said, you do battle scrap, it automatically puts in three disintegrators, no, no brainer stuff. But, um, but I also, uh, you know, going in, I, I knew that I needed to, um, I needed to establish board control, uh, but I also needed to be patient, uh, knowing that my army really turns on and turn three with the assault doctrine. Um, and so, you know, his, his secondaries, I think you asked this question earlier. So secondaries, um, before you dive into that, will you, uh, we lay out the mission type for us and kind of just like the general board layout. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so the, uh, let's see, it was hammer and anvil. So it was a uh, mission 11 retrieval mission. I always call it hammer and anvil, but, uh, it's the short, lo- short board edge going long. Um, and so, uh, we had, uh, the terrain was actually a really cool setup. Um, the best way to describe it is they had a, they had a forest in the middle 
And then they had uh, two sets of four buildings in a concentric circle is the best way to describe it. And the buildings were going to the corners. Uh, and so they were obs- all, f- all eight buildings were obscuring. Uh, the first four around the, around the center of the board were kind of on the four corners. Um, and then behind them was a, an additional set of buildings. Uh, the ones in the middle, though, were, were true line of sight. I mean, they were obscuring, but once you moved on or within it, you unlock true line of sight. The ones on the edges, though, uh, pretty much blacked out all of the windows. Um, and so with that force in the middle, it created an interesting, because you're going to take a minus one to hit and shooting, uh, and you kind of had to plan for that. Um, so I kind of like the terrain set. It forced a lot of tactical play and maneuvering around the buildings and knowing where the footprint of the obscuring terrain is and playing the angles, which I really enjoy that kind of a game. Uh, but that was the terrain setup. Um, beautiful terrain at uh, Tables and Towers, that, that game out there in Westminster uh, Mall in Maryland. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, as far as the uh, – that was the deployment. The mission had six objectives as you, as you look at Mission 11. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was, that was kind of the deployment, uh, the terrain and, uh, and the mission, um, as far as secondaries go, um, yeah, I was thinking I, of those. I, okay. I went to, uh, I went with engage in all fronts, which is kind of bread and butter for me. Um, I also went with oath a moment. Sometimes it, it can be kind of, uh, kind of a, a luck of the draw as to, you know, whether I go first or second, but even going first, I can, I typically are going to get about 10 points, especially if my opponent has a lot of characters and vehicles, which he did. Uh, so that's why my third secondary was bring it down. Um, now Sean went with, I think, engage in all fronts while we stand, we fight, which is the auto include disintegrators, uh, and then scramblers. Um, and so that was the, that was the lay down. Um, and then, my plan of attack is kind of what I said, which was, you know, kind of control the center and, and sit there until turn three, uh, do minimal moves to, to grab points since it was a uh, control one, control two, you know, or more. And I was just going to keep taking the 10 each time. Um, the other thing is he went first. Uh, and so, um, Ooh, you know, that's, that's, I have to give you the oath for you because going second against Ad Mech is not your friend. So I, I agree, and I, I've been on the receiving end of Mark Hurdle's ad mech, and it is brutal. Um, so, but what was really surprising for me was in one turn of indirect fire, he killed all four of my blade guard, um, which I've never seen before. And now I'll tell Did you, you say what, one I, turn of just indirect. Yeah, his three disintegrators just put all three of their indirect fire, and I. You talk about sometimes dice, dice, dice plays a you know, and you try and mitigate that right through, uh, you know, play and all that stuff, but I, I can't mitigate rolling a bunch of ones and twos, uh, even with the feel no pain, it just like literally picked them up. Um, and so when I lost my, my blocking unit in the middle, my brick, it kind of, my whole game plan went to crap at that point. So I had to kind of, we'll re- give you that yeah. one pass there yeah. on the die step. Well, it, it happens, but you know, I mean, you don't want to keep, you know, you don't want to keep whining about dice. I mean, dice happens. You gotta, you gotta play the odds and understand it's math, but so you gotta do what you can to mitigate it. And so, you know, I, I stuck with the plan and I, I kept uh, focusing on, you know, grabbing one objective. Now, the other thing was um, I said I, 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 I played conservatively. I also deployed conservatively, uh, which was, I think, one of the biggest mistakes. Um, typically, I'll have my intercessors bunched up in a building um, on one flank. So if I'm playing in the middle, I got intercessors on my left. I got a whirlwind with Vanguard on my right. And then pretty much the rest of my army is hiding behind, it, behind a big line of sight block and piece of terrain and just bunched up. Um, in this case, I spread out a little bit further, had some suppressors over by the whirlwind. Uh, and I just didn't, I, I was, I didn't deploy the way I normally do. And like when Brad was laughing, I had, I had a good game plan and then I just went completely different direction. And I did that on deployment. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, and so because of that, I was, I was, I was trying to play catch up, you know, and I wasn't really able to play the game that I'm used to playing. Uh, and, and so that kind of set me back. And from then on out, it was kind of a catch up game for me. So do you feel like um like the terrain in general like do you feel like that affected like maybe your mindset when you got to the table like if it feels like a favorable board to you when you sit, when you walk into it do you feel like maybe that affected the way you put your deployment and changed your mind once you hit the table No I mean I we had so this terrain layout is used down at Fredericksburg in your hobby place the GT there um anthony up uh, anthony birdsong who owns tables and towers has used this train deployment in the gt ran i think a month ago um so i've been kind of practicing with it with mark hurdle 
Um, I, I think I just, I, I don't know why I decided to do something different, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the terrain layout is, is very favorable to my arm. Um, cause it gives me a lot, enough line of sight blocking to where I can pretty much hide my entire arm. Um, but I hid them too well and too far back. And I should have been a little more aggressive in putting them right up on the edges of the buildings. Um, so I could jump right out and, and, and advance, you know, up the field onto objectives. So. Well, especially with the yeah. fact that any of your Vanguard vets, especially if you put them in assault, are just going to pick up a lot of anything they hit, tell you the truth. You've got favorable trades pretty much anywhere. So, yeah, the, the definitely the... Uh, well, tell us, basically, we'll go into the second part of what we what we can and could and should have done kind of thing. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about actually how it played out. And then in part two, we'll go over the specifics of the changes you could have made to... May rectify that and also any changes you're thinking about you know in this building and anything else uh, yeah, so just no. give us kind of the rundown no, great question brad um yeah so the so the game um you know he had turn one uh like i said the the blade guard were pretty much picked up uh turn one um he advanced up his uh his boat that had the full grade electro priests um you know you talk about targets that's that's one of the primary ones i'm looking at i'm also i also am concerned about his uh, bomber that has the one CP strat to take away auras within six inches. So I also deployed kind of spread out because I knew he could do that on turn one. Um, and so that's why that, that flyer was also a priority target for me. Cause if I could take it out, it, it not just takes that threat away. It also starts hurting him on the engage on all fronts, which he's going to try to account, accumulate points as the game goes on. But, um, because I had both of those as my priority threat, you know, there wasn't really a one and two. They were both ones. I had my suppressors go into the flyer, and I had my multi-melt attack bikes go into the boat. Uh, and that trend of rolling ones and twos continued in the multi-meltas, uh, or twos in this case. Uh, and so even though two got through, they just didn't do enough damage to open the boat up, uh, which I had a Vanguard vet squad waiting outside with, uh, with lightning claws revved up, ready to go. And fortunately, no one emerged. So at that point, you know, I had to play really, really uh, cagey and uh, assault it, but do as, as little as possible to kill it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, Dice kind of played a game as well, played a role and uh, ended up blowing it up. They got out, but I was able to screen them, but I had to use two Vanguard vets to screen out his priests, which meant that they were going to die. Uh, and then I was losing some of my units that I normally can throw out there and do good trades with. Um, and so from then on out, uh, his last chickens were back in the back end with 48 inch range. Anytime I, a unit popped out to grab an objective, they would, they would pretty much, uh, try and nuke it. Um, and so it, it became very apparent by the time we got to turn three, that the game was pretty much over all at that point. I was just trying to, you know, get as many points as possible. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's kind of where, where it ended. So, um, we, we had a three hour round. We finished well before the three hours. Um, but, uh, now it was a great game. I had a great opponent hats off to him. He, he played it very well. Uh, you know, for me, the big lesson learned is you go in with a game plan. Don't change it on the fly. Stick with it. Uh, what you practice with, just continue to emulate. On that. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that makes sense. So, I mean, that's. <clears throat> Yeah, but the funny thing is, and I've done it before, and I think all of us have done it, is just you, you start out with a few small errors, and then you have a, a round that doesn't go your way. And, you know, basically, usually, anytime that I make a mistake, the, the dice gods see me and go, oh, I see you uh, made that movement error, that deployment error, and then things go awry after that. It's hard to keep the level head and then get back on to your... To your uh, game plan itself yeah you're right brad and that that and that's but you know that wasn't the end of the story because there were four more games to play after that and, and the tables were flipped um stuck to the game plan and kind of won out so um you know applied the lessons learned from game one and applied them in the lesson you know in, the, in two three four and five so worked out pretty do well do you feel like you got rattled at all after you uh after you kind of had that round of poor luck on the um, blade guard, you know, losing those hurts. Do you think you made like maybe some, I don't know, some mistakes somewhere like after, after losing them, or do you feel like you played it pretty well? No, no, I think you're right. I, I think uh, looking back, I, I think I, I know I was a little perturbed, rattled um, after losing the blade guard. Um, Cause usually that's a unit I rely on to keep, you know, keep my uh, anchor, my center. 
Um, right. Yeah. And, and then the Brad, you, you mentioned you're at that point, you're kind of trying to chase down, you know what I mean? You're continuing to chase down to, Hey, if I keep, keep to, eventually I'll catch up. Well, that, that it was just a comedy of things kind of one after another. And it was like, you're not going to catch that. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if there, there may have been a way to, to, to kind of flip it. Um, you know, I'm still thinking through how could I have done it? Um, and nothing really comes to mind, which is probably not what you want to hear. But, um, at well, one point I just realized, I'm not, I'm not gonna I've got a, so I've got a bunch out. of questions for that. Yeah. For I'll part bet you do. do. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, because of the fact that, uh, we're going to ask and when we go into part two about specific, uh, obviously we'll talk about things you could have done different in deployment and stuff and moving forward, obviously, because you play Mark a lot, you already know kind of your game plan on that, but also like, uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions about just movements and whatnot that you could have possibly done uh, for moving forward in the, in the, yeah, into the next games. Do you feel like, so do you have, am I still going? Indeed you are. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm me to 25 minute mark somewhere. I got to put that in there. I freaking, my mic is coming on. I mean, yeah, you can definitely mark that. That's when I forgot how to speak. So that helps a lot too. <laughs> That's okay. I, I just realized I just kept talking and talking and didn't give you guys an opportunity to weigh in. So no, <laughs> that's, what, that's what we want anyways, though. It was beautiful. Oh, no, let's, absolutely. let's be honest. It, we literally set everything up and then we, uh, I, I won't ask relevant shit until part two anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna roll back in too much away for you guys. That's what I want to make sure. So yeah, I'm gonna roll right. in back in at 26:30 here. I got a question about uh, about your splitting targets and stuff like that. Not digging too much in. I'm just trying to like you know visualize the mistakes and all that. So mm-hmm. Mike, do you feel like that whenever you kind of split your fire there between the suppressors and the attack bikes, you feel like maybe that was a mistake going into? Yeah, no, it, it was a mistake. And, and that's kind of, you know, I was considering both of them a priority. I should have just said, all right, this is the priority. Open the boat up, kill the Fulgurite Electro Priest. Because once they're dead, I can weather the shooting. I mean, there's strats I can use and other things, you know, but once those priests are out of the way, it, it, pretty much there's nothing going to stop my army once turn three hits, uh, unless I happen to get like, you know, one round of shooting wiped out. Um, but yeah, so I think that was one of the one of the key mistakes early on was splitting my fire. I should have just doubled down and put everything into, you know, sometimes overwhelming firepower is a quality of its own, you know. And so in this case, I should have just put everything into that boat, opened it up, and then hit those guys with my uh, Vanguard vets. And I think it would have been a different game. If you think about, uh, I'm going to quote, uh, oh God, I'm going to quote Nick Nanavati on this one. Uh, if you listen to the Art of War coaching, he always talks about, you know, simplifying the board state. And I think that that's like, uh, that's important there. You know, you take away that element in the middle and then it's all you have to worry about is that flyer. And then you, you say, how can I, you know, hide something to where that flyer is no longer a threat to me? And yeah, I, th- I think that, uh, I, th- I think you obviously saw that because it's something you brought up pretty, pretty immediately there. Going into that, there's the thing is, is that focusing down stuff obviously is, is key to a lot of things because when you gamble, sometimes you, Things do not come up, you know what I mean. So, and it's a dice rolling game. So, we you you were already on the one train. So sometimes the, the, those trains continue on. Sadly, yeah, I think I think uh, like you said, uh, simplifying the board state. Completely agree with that. Um, you know, taking out one threat uh, at least. You know, it's one less you're gonna have to deal with because I piecemealed myself into two separate threats. And oh, by the way, the flyer didn't die either. Uh, I had to commit a Vanguard vet to assault and kill it out, you know, after. So I had to commit resources to the flyer at the same time, the boat. I should have just gone one or the other. And I think the boat was probably the better call because the flyer, yeah, I could probably, you know, um, move block the flyer so it can't get to my apothecary or my chaplain, you know, who are really the big auras I'm concerned about. So, yeah, that, that's a that's a good point that Nick has. Completely agree. Well, do you got any other questions for uh, for Mike today, Brad? I'm just going to get into a lot of specifics in part two for it. So let's go ahead and rock and roll and invite everybody into phase two. Part two is going to be Aaron pretty much immediately after this. If you're listening now, you're likely going to be listening to the next part. And this next part is going to be fantastic. We're really going to dive into really the why, what, you know, what, what is, what is he going to do to change? What strategies is he going to implement? What things is he thinking about changing for the meta to accommodate for the loss? Is he thinking about anything at all? Who knows? Mike may think this is the best list he has to offer. And he just thinks, Hey, if I did this one thing different, I think I would have won that game. So we'll really just dive into it in part two. So stick around with us. And if just a reminder, everyone out there, we got some really exciting content out there on the art of war website, 
So go check us out. Subscribe to our channel. Check out the part twos to all of our podcasts. Check out our other podcasts, Art of War and The Art of War Down Under. And just check it all out at the website, theartofwar40k.com. And lastly, we'll be doing a brief Q&A at the end of part two to answer your questions. So we're on a little bit of a delay, so we will be filming questions from the previous episodes. So just check it out. Email me all your questions, concerns, feedback at blake at theartofwar40k.com. Thanks for listening and join us for part two. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network, theartofwar40k.com.